Hello, this is Benjamin. Welcome to Virtual IoT. We're back from the holiday seasons. Um, so unfortunately, we have problem, problems with Google Hangouts at the moment, and our speaker, Julian Vermeer, is having trouble joining the session. We tried like 30 minutes ago, and he was fine, and now um, Hangouts stopped working on this computer. So we're doing our best to be online um, ASAP. Please give us a few a few more minutes, and we hope to be to be with you soon. Welcome, Julien. We are live. Uh, okay. I'm, I'm showing your slides right now if you want to... Uh... I have a very bad noise. Um, okay, you, you hear me? It's... Yes, yes, we hear you very well. So do you want me to show your slides or...? Uh, let me check if it works. Um, okay, so... Mm. Okay, you see my slides? Yes. So uh, we finally figured it out. Only seven minutes behind schedule. Thanks, uh, thanks everyone for your for your patience. So yeah, we're back from from the holiday seasons, and today we are with Julien Vermeer from CR Wireless. As you may know, Julien is um, is working on um, uh, on like WebM2M, uh, and he's also a, a security expert at CR Wireless. And yeah, he's a committer on, I think, three Eclipse projects, three Eclipse IT projects. So, Julian, why don't you introduce yourself further and tell you, tell us all about my like, WebM2M. <laughs> okay, so you already uh, said a lot about me. Um, I'm a software developer. Uh, my main work is, um, is to implement protocols and security layer uh, between the devices and the cloud. Uh, for Sierra Wireless Cloud Platform. Uh, it's called Avantage. It's a cloud platform for managing uh, devices and building applications on top of that. Yeah, it's probably yet another IoT application, but uh, combining uh, everything from device management, connectivity, and applications. So yes, I am, and also I'm working on the different um, open source projects, uh, Benjamin said, so Wakama, uh, Leishan, uh, and California, so mainly around uh, Co-op and Lightweight M2M. So, uh, okay, so the presentation is about Lightweight M2M, how to use it and how to build application and managing application uh, using this protocol. So first, yes. Okay, first the agenda. So uh, first, a small context um, about Lightweight M2M. Uh, um, what is trying to solve? So the, the Internet of Things challenge, I would call it. Uh, then an introduction to device management. What is it exactly and why you need it? Then a real introduction with more details about uh, Lightweight M2M. And uh, to finish uh, more uh, more details, so about the security layer in Lightweight M2M, which is a quite a, a common concern for IoT application, and yes, and to give you then more um, more pointers and uh, more details on where to start for 
for starting to implement the lightweight M2M applications. So, um, so first, uh, you probably know uh, machine to machine. Um, it's um, it's um, it's quite old now. It's maybe twenty years old. Um, the idea is to connect different machines, uh, probably of the same type. For example, I don't know uh, any industrial uh, industrial machine, and to connect that to a server, to a remote server using any technologies, but mainly cellular modems, and to do that using maybe internet, but maybe a private network. So this is really the idea. I have an application. I want to monitor it, gather telemetry values, uh, and push that to a server and build an application on top of that. So then we start to see the Internet of Things challenge, um, which is basically not anymore connecting only um, not only uh, the same type of machine, but connecting everything. Now we have the technology for connecting everything. We have a um, small uh, CPU with a lot of power for connecting to the internet and also um, cheap enough to be put in the in a consumer device. So we want to connect everything from cities to smart home, to cars, to, to uh, wearables. And we want everything to work together with um, quite complex application. Not anymore. I want to connect only the same machine to my server. I want to connect a lot of different objects to different applications. So a lot of people started to think about the, this, uh, this challenge. They were, oh, we are going to, to solve this problem. We have very different uh, applications. We have very different devices. So the uh, first idea was to reuse the concept of the web. The web is uh, a really successful model, so why not reuse it for, for IoT? So first, you can just expose every possible sensor, every possible actuator for, from your devices using a, a REST style, style API. So basically, if you have a, if you have a light bulb, you have a, an API for putting it on or off, but maybe you have more control uh, for changing the light. And if it's a car, it's the same idea. You have different sensors, the fuel, the position, the GPS position, or maybe uh, you can have a, a, a URI for starting, stopping the engine. So that's the idea. And, um, and you are just going to expose very simple objects. You don't put a lot of behavior in the object. And you put the behavior in the application. And the application is, is going to change often. Maybe every two years, you are going to build a new application. But the objects are here for to stay. So your object is maybe here for 10 years. So another revolution uh, is, um, is about um, the wireless communication uh, for carrying the last night. So basically, uh, now we have technologies like threads, like six slow pants, like Bluetooth low energy, where you can put an IP connectivity, basically connecting an object to internet, uh, but on a very low power network. Uh, for for example, for an object just running on. Um, on a simple and simple battery. Um, for example, you can connect your TV, your TV remote. Your TV remote is maybe going to, to be powered by a, a single battery and it need to, to, to stay one or two years without replacing the battery. But you want to connect that also on the internet. Now we have the technology for doing that. For, for example, with six low pound or thread or Bluetooth, you can have object connected to the internet and still using very low power battery. But there is some set challenges. This kind of network are not really like the usual uh, internet uh, networks. You have very small MTU. Uh, for example, for six low pan network, you have 100 byte MTU. So that 
you can't directly use HTTP, uh, TCP-based uh, based protocol like MQTT. For MQTT, if you want to, to, to use that on a constrained network, you need to use a MQTT SN. And uh, you can't directly use the good old protocol we all know, like HTTP WebSocket. It's going to consume too much bandwidth and create too, too big packets, and it's not going to be battery efficient also. So uh, the COA protocol was born at the IETF, and the idea behind COA is to, um, to address uh, this kind of networks and to connect the last mile, the low power networks and the low power sensor to the internet, something we were unable to do previously. Uh, it's targeting very low power networks, uh, as I said, but also very um, cheap devices with microcontroller, with few kilobytes of RAM, few kilobytes of flash, and uh, not a lot of um, and a lot of uh, power consumption. So Coop uh, simply it's a very compact uh, protocol built on top of UDP and trying to recreate all the good, uh, good well-known architecture of the web. So it's basically for building RESTful API on devices. So the device exposes the, the, the API. And you have URL, media types, get pods to delete uh, verbs. You have uh, even a transparent proxy thing, proxy for with, with HTTP, you can have a proxy translating HTTP command into co-op commands. And some extra feature like observe. Observe is something you don't have in HTTP 1.1. It's, uh, it's the idea of I get a value on the device, I receive a value, but the next time the value change, the device push it without uh, waiting a get from the server. So you can get a value and you don't have to pull and then lastly the device the device are going to, to is going to push you the different values so as i said it's a binary protocol it's compact uh, it's made also for having a, a, a low complexity for implementation on constrained devices so it's really simple to to decode a bit like uh, mqtt um, and you have uh, an extensible uh, model like HTTP. You have something called options. It's really looking like HTTP headers, but it's binary. So you can also have a payload, of course, and that's all. It's it's co -op. You have a transmission for UDP and packet loss, but it's not that complex. Um, also. We have um, we have co-op for solving the web of things problem. You now we want to have device management. What is device management? So device management is the idea you you are going to build a, a fleet of devices with a complex application or maybe a simple application. Anyway, you need to secure it, you need to monitor it, you need to manage it. What does that mean? That means you need to send maybe configuration. Maybe you want to to upgrade the different software in your application, in your device. And you want also to monitor it to know if the device is working correctly or not. Uh, does it, it's using a lot of bandwidth. Uh, does uh, the wireless stack is working correctly? Do you have a good uh, signal reception? Every, every, every values you want to monitor for, for being sure you your, your, your deployment, your fleet, your application is working correctly. And, well, you don't want to do that for, uh, for every different hardware. You, you are going to build a very, probably a very complex application. Maybe you are going to use one or two different hardware platform. Um, maybe the next year you are going to change of hardware platform. You don't want to have a, a new way to manage your devices. If every time you, you you build a new revision of your hardware, if you need to change the way you are going to do the firmware upgrade, uh, it's going to be very problematic. 
And you want also to, to build that on, of course, on, on a standard because you want to avoid any vendor lock. Uh, you want to be able to, to manage your device with one software or one other or change the, the underlying platform. So uh, that's the idea of Lightweight m 2 m is ready to build an API on top of Coop, a standard API for managing devices. So the first, uh, what are the features of Lightweight M2M is managing security, of course, the device gathering information about the device, um, change the server, uh, which uh, device need to connect to which server, connectivity monitoring, as I explained, I, uh, of course, gathering statistics, uh, does my uh, device send a lot of SMS or send a lot of byte on the on on the wire? Um, get maybe tracks the location of a device if it's an application uh, with some kind of GPS and mobility. Uh, of course, doing firmware upgrade which is probably the most important feature. Software management: if you have multiple applications running on your device, you can install applications, start stop the application. Um, you have different uh, objects and API for managing different parts of um, IoT application. But it's not an API like you can think um, for a classical REST API. Uh, it's not going to have complex URI because we are addressing um, very compact, um, very compact uh, devices. So we are going to use numerical identifier in place of saying slash devices. We are going to say slash tree. So for example, how to build how the lightweight and twin API is built. Um, you have an object. So you have different objects: the device, the server, the location, the, the software, the you have a lot of different objects and you have you can have multiple instances so some objects have only one instance for example device or location have only one instance because well the device is unique uh, in his api and the position also is unique for one device but for example for uh, software uh, if you have multiple software you can have multiple instances so um Yes, and so you build the, the URL in, in a consistent way. So you have, uh, for example, you have the location object, it's object six. If you, if you get on the six slash zero, you get the whole location object, the latitude, the longitude, the speed, the altitude, the, the precision, uh, different parameters. If you want just to get the longitude, for example, you do get on six slash zero slash one and you get only the longitude. It's what basically the specification of Lightweight m 2 is describing. So you have, for example, the object device for give you uh, another example. In the object device, you have uh, resources, uh, an ID for manufacturer for the model numbers, the serial numbers, the firmware version. Um, you have uh, an object for triggering a reboot if you want to reboot uh, your device remotely for resetting to factory settings for monitoring the power sources if you are um, using a battery you can see the battery level the memory you can get some error code management for example if you want to check if if your device have a problem the device can put a code inside these resources and say, okay, I'm out of memory or I have any other problem. You can also use uh, this object for setting the time, the time zone, or, or read, simply reading the time to replace, for example, NTP. If you don't want to, to have a full NTP client in your device, you can use that for, for connecting, for updating the, the, the time. And you can also have your own applicative object. So you can define your own object for your application. And there is a nice feature in Coop for discovering new new part of the API. So you can discover new object and you can get from the device a description of what is this object and what are the resources, what are the title of the resources. So you can even build a, a, a UI without even knowing what you have in the object. 
You have also uh, compatibility with uh, IP smart object alliance um, specification about smart object, about IP based smart object. Um, I will show you an example uh, in the demo. So, EPSO is standardizing different object, well known object of uh, IoT application like accelerometer, temperature, lights, sensor, um, and uh, you can build a, uh, um, a thermostat or uh, any application in a consistent way if you follow this standard. So uh, let's do a demo. So uh, let me take the time to connect my webcam. Um, So just a quick reminder to everyone watching, if you have any questions, feel free to either uh, tweet them using the hashtag virtual IoT, or you can use the Q&A section in Google Hangouts. You can also comment on Meetup. I mean, there, there are many ways to ask questions and yeah, we will uh, try and, I mean, Julian will uh, answer them at, at, the, at the end of the presentation. Okay, uh, maybe you can see my screen. Yes. Okay, so this is a public Lation sandbox. It's a public. Um, it's a public like Twitter to M server, so you can test uh, to connect your own devices on on, on, on this server. Uh, it's great for discovering the protocol and the capabilities. Um, I have a, a webcam. Also, somewhere. Okay. And it's not working. Check. Okay. Okay. So, up. Okay. So I can show you my device. So my device is a simple. Um, it's a very simple um, microcontroller. It's an embed. Uh, embed board uh, from ARM. Um, it's a Cortex M3 CPU, so it's a very simple microcontroller. So you you are not able to run Linux or Windows or whatever on that. You 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 need to 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 do the things with uh, bar metals. Um, so it's running Wacom. I will talk uh, a bit more of Wakama later. So um, the object is is uh, is um, is just exposing the different value, the different light to term object. So, for example, I have the, the device. I can read it. Um, so I can see the manufacturer, the model number, the serial number, the version. I can reboot it here, and um, I can manage the battery level. You, uh, Everything I show you in the presentation, I can also uh, update the firmware if I want. So if this is the API for updating the firmware, so I have resources, uh, I can write a URI. So for example, I can put HTTP uh, uh, and it's going to download the binary. Um, and here I have an IPSO object. So basically, the IPSO object here is a um, temperature sensor. So the IPSO standard is describing you how to, how to structure your API for this temperature sensor. So you can have a mean value, max value, a range, the sensor value, the unit up. So I can read the temperature is 32 degree. I can read it multiple times, but I can also do an observe. So if I put my finger on my sensor, okay, 
So you're going to see the value growing or not. Okay, I'm not so odd today. Okay, so anyway, the value are streamed from, from the device to, to the server without sending a request. I can stop the observe. You have also this object. This, is, this one is light control, so it's uh, for controlling a light. I can write um, I can write a value. Um, let me see if I can connect uh, to my webcam. Okay, I wifi. Okay. Okay. So I want to show you. Okay, uh, so this is my device. Um, okay, so I can on the on, on the top corner, on top right corner, there is a LED. So I can just blink, if I will change the value of the LED uh, with this ob ips object. For example, if I choose um, RGB, so this is going to be purple, and I put the light on. And I go back to my video. Okay, it's purple. So that's really the idea to, to, to put very simple API on the devices and put the behavior on the cloud, on the server, on, on the mobile phone application or whatever. Uh, and to try to get the device as simple as possible so you can evolve easily. You make the evolution in your application and not in the device. Uh, you have also an accelerometer uh, on this demo, so I can read the values, I can observe the values, and if I move my my device, it's going to change. So now I have an object with a nice API, I can update it, I can monitor it, I can do a lot of things, so I can build my my application on top of this foundation. Uh, so let's go back to the slides. So uh, let's talk about security. So um, Lightweight like M2M is built on top of Coa, so it's going to use DTLS. DTLS is uh, is the TLS version SSL, you know, uh, what you are using every day with HTTPS, it's basically TLS. And DTLS is this version of TLS, but for datagram for UDP packets, because Coop is using UDP, because TCP is not fitting on the constrained networks. Um, so we have here a focus on AES, because uh, AES is uh, something more and more common in hardware. Uh, for example, in this kind of uh, Cortex chip, you can have an AES accelerator, so you don't have to do your computation inside your, your application. You can delegate that to the hardware. Um, and also for, uh, for asymmetrical cryptography, there is strong focus on elliptic curve cryptography. Um, and also it's built for, well, it's I'm not sure it was built for, maybe it's a side effect, but it's working on low power network, like the 100 bytes MTU for six open device. So uh, if we go more in detail, so there is different cipher suit uh, for DTLS to, to, to use with, uh, with a co-op. Uh, the first one is using pre-shared keys, so a password for session, session authentication, and AES for the encryption with the CBC mode, uh, uh, not the CBC mode, the counter CBC mode, which is a authentication encryption cipher, which is doing the authentication, the encryption in the same stream. And yes, it's using the, the, the short version, version 8, um, yes, it's in M8 because, uh, because it's more compact than the usual CCM. Um, so if I try to to, to, to get um, clearer and simpler. 
Um, so PSK mean you don't use certificate like you use on HTTPS, you just use password. You just have a shared common password between your device and your server. It's like your Wi-Fi password. You know the password, the, the, the server knows the password, and you can have a challenge for authenticating uh, both ways, the device and the server. CCM8 is just for compactness, and it's already uh, 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 secure and compact cipher for, for TLS. For example, the uncheck of uh, DTLS PSK with CCM8 is going to be one kilobytes, uh, uh -huh. which is really smaller than the usual TLS uncheck you do with your browser, which is more like six kilobytes. Uh, the size really depends on the certificate you, have, you are using with the HTTPS, but this is the first uh, cipher suite you can use with Lightweight m 2 m Co-op. It's yeah. really compact. If you want more security uh, feature, you can maybe use this, this cipher suite, so ECD Hachi with uh, ECD SA. So, uh, ECDH is a Diffie Hellman using elliptic curve, so it's what we call perfect forward secrecy. The idea is um, you have some kind of uncheck when you start your, your security session, and um, if someone rob your private key, uh, he can decrypt your past communication. And um, you have also ECDSA for in place of using PSK and and simple password. If you want um, something more flexible, maybe more secure, you can use Xfavo NAT9 certificate or uh, raw public key. Well, basically like HTTPS, but you can you need to use it both way. The server need to have a certificate and the device need to have a certificate. So uh, every site can authenticate the, 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 the other side. So um, yes, the idea of uh, using T DTLS on the constrained devices is to try to do something we call end-to-end -end security. So how we do security without that, for example, when you don't use uh, DTLS but by an, an, an IP connectivity on the sensor network, Maybe if you use ZP, you are not directly going to use um, IP or connect the device to internet. So you need to have a, co uh, a gateway. The gateway collect the data. So the gateway have one feet, one foot on the, on, on the left and one on the right. One uh, speaking with the sensor network, gathering data with a specific security layer with maybe low or no security. For example, ZP security start to be not so great. And on the right, you connect to the cloud, so you're going to use uh, probably TLS, HTTPS, uh, MQTT, uh, whatever, which is fitting your, your needs on the on this side. And you are going to use TLS to encrypt your, your communications. Uh, the problem with this model is um, on the left side, on the local network, you are weak most of the time. If you don't put um, a strong uh, security layer on that, if you just use ZB or if you if you do custom security, is probably something weak. And if someone try to attack uh, your gateway from from the network and get access to your to your gateway, is going to get access to all the sensor network because uh, the gateway is the, the device doing the job to collecting data, so it have access to all the all the sub network. Um, so yes, there is some other problem with this uh, this model is uh, you are mixing IP and non IP network. It's not really simple. You have on one side a non IP network, and on the other side you have a, a full IP network and internet. It's lacking of flexibility uh, compared to end-to-end -end IP. It's like your when you are connecting to internet with your with your PC, you want to 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 browse any website. If you are using Wi-Fi, cellular connectivity, or a wire, it's the same behavior. Here, if you change the the sensor network topology or protocol, it's not so simple to to put against the system working. 
Uh, also, it's not so simple to, to scale with like something like IP routing. So um, uh, if you do end-to-end -end security, so if you your low power node uh, speak DTLS directly with the cloud service, and your gateway is not anymore a gateway, it's a simple router routing packets, IP packets. If everything is encrypted starting from, from the sensor network, from the sensor node, um, your, your gateway is not anymore a, a, prob well, a, a problem. If someone breaks into it, it's not going to be able to decrypt the, uh, the communication and it's maybe going to interrupt the service, but not going to, to rob any any data by sniffing the communications. And also on the on the wireless uh, side, on the sensor network, you have strong crypto using DTLS, so it's not so easy to sniff it like a ZigBee network. So yes, so then uh, this is only a part of the building a, a, a secure IoT application. So you have also, you need to, to distribute key, you need to distribute password, you need to, to have a unique password for every device, you need also to be able to change those secrets, and you need to be, yes, and probably you want to change it quickly because the first secret you put in the factory, you are not so, you don't trust so much your factory. So like to have a mechanism for, for, for distributing keys. So at the factory, you put some credentials. Um, when the device, uh, start to connect to the internet, say, okay, I have only the factory bootstrap credential. I don't know uh, who I need to, to contact for my application. So the device is going to connect to something we call the bootstrap server. The bootstrap server only job is to write uh, the different server URL for the device and the access control list. So which server is able to do uh, this action and not this action. And then the device is going to connect to the real uh, application server. So maybe this is a smart uh, smart lighting application. So the light bulb is going to connect to the smart automation, the, the, the home automation server, and also to register on device management server. Maybe the device management server is going to be in charge on doing the uh, firmware upgrade, and the home automation server is just going to be in charge on the applications or automation application. So yes, so you can have access control list, so you decide uh, which device can connect to which server and which server can do, uh, can have access to what this, each server can do with the different objects. So this, this server can access to the device object, but not to the firmware ready object. And maybe this server can only access to, I don't know, the light, the IPSO smart light uh, object. And maybe only on read only or with write or access or not, this server can trigger a reboot or not. So um, if you want to get started with, um, with, uh, with Lightweight M2M, there is two projects at Eclipse IoT, two open source projects. Uh, for connecting to, to the, your object and creating a server. One, the first one is Leshan. Leshan is an implementation of this protocol uh, in Java. It's a simple Java library, so for building server and client now. So it's really friendly for Java developer because it's used no framework. It's only a few dependencies, so you can uh, put that in, uh, in the Spring server on a, an OHGI container, it's working. So it's really uh, simple Java. It's, you have also the web UI, the web UI I've shown you for, for discovering and testing. It's not something you can use in production. It's really a simple server, so it's really an example and something for discovering the protocol. You build it using Maven, Maven itself, it's very simple. It's based on two other um, Eclipse IoT project, Californium and Scanium. Uh, Californium is a co-op implementation, Scanium a DTLS implementation, both in Java. You have this public uh, sandbox, you can uh, you can play with this sandbox. Uh, my device is probably still connected to this sandbox, this sandbox so you can try to change uh, the LED color, if you want, or, 
or scream the, the temperature values. Um, it's supporting IPv4 and IPv6. So if you have an IPv6 based application you want to test, you can test it, uh, this one uh, with uh, this sandbox. And you have a feature, you press uh, co-op messages and you can see low level trust, uh, which is perfect for debugging or, uh, or learning more about how the protocol is working. Wakama is a C implementation of, uh, of Lightweight to M2M, is more targeting embedded application. Um, it's not a, a shared library for, for using on Linux, it's more a, a bunch of, uh, of C files you put inside your project and then you wire everything for build your, your, your IoT application. Um, it's embedded friendly, but it's, uh, it's uh, still um, using dynamic memory, so it's not so uh, so bar metal. It's um, the code is quite simple uh, to understand. And the idea of Wakama is you need to bring your own IP stack and your own ETLS implementation, so it's very easy to port it to to. You have an example on how to, to, to use Wakama on the embed with a embed uh, IP stack or on Linux or on Quantiki, but it's free to you to provide the, your own callback with your own IP stack because you have a strange hardware platform. And for DTLS is exactly, you can use it with the, any DTLS implementation you, you want. Um, so you can register, upgrade, uh, you can create uh, object, you can read, write uh, values, uh, you need to create your handler for, for your object. And also it's supporting observe. So yes, so you have a different object, um, uh, different files, uh, one for managing object, one for observe, one for packets, one for, for co-op, one for uh, encoding, one for uh, one for doing a linked list. So it's um, really easy. You put this file in your project and you start, um, you look at the example on how to initialize the library and creating your object callback and you can quickly start um, uh, a lightweight m term client. You have also Tiny DTLS, which is a new project. It's still a proposal. Uh, I think the project is going to be uh, created uh, soon. Yeah, the project actually created. So the oh, project, okay. yeah, the it's project nice. for Tiny DTLS is in the process of actually contributing the code. But yeah, this is uh, this is happening. This should be a matter of uh, a few more weeks before the code is available. Oh, okay. In the meantime, it's on SourceForge, right? Yes, you can find the code on SourceForge. Um, and it's supporting the tool Cypher Suite I'm presenting you uh, with CMM8 AES. Um, you have example on how to run it on Linux or, or Contiki, uh, but it's, the code is not so complex. It's really uh, simple to, you need to do some modification, but to run it on another uh, platform like Embed, it's not so difficult. So if I want to put that in real hardware, um, for, if you want to put Wakama on real hardware, with, um, you can, for example, you can put that on a Spark core with a Cortex-M3. Uh, with DTLS, uh, it's not using so much RAM and so much ROM. You can also run Wakama on Arduino Mega, which is a, well, eight bits microcontroller, which is quite small microcontroller, but you are not going to be able to run DTLS because uh, the microprocessor is too small for that, but you can at least have a lightweight m 2 stack. So that's all. Uh, thank you. If you have any question now, uh, anyway, you have a pointer with, to the new Leishan website and if you need to ask me question after the hangout, you can send it to using Twitter or by emails. So I will try to switch back to to hangout. All right. So uh, there's actually one question on on Twitter already, and yes, again, please make sure to. Uh, to ask them now. Now is your chance. You still have a few more minutes. So the question is, 
uh, when you were talking about end-to-end -end security, um, what is what is the impact of uh, securing IoT communications on both the network latency and the cost of the communication? So on the network latency, you don't have any cost. Uh, just when you start to do the uncheck, you, you need to do the uncheck. It's going to have some latency, maybe multiple seconds, uh, depending on your device. But once your session is there, uh, when you, and it's not costing so much bandwidth, like 1K of bandwidth if you are using PSK with CCM8. And, um, and then uh, when you are pushing uh, values to the networks, you are pushing applicative data, the overhead is not so much. Um, it's really depending on the size of your packet, but it's uh, uh, 20 or 30 bytes, uh, depending on what you are doing. Um, yes, and uh, this is not going ready to to change the way your devices, your application is working. You, if you are doing real-time application, uh, putting DTLS is not going to change that. Uh, for example, DTLS is also used for securing voice over IP communication, and nothing is more real-time than voice over IP communications. Yeah. Um, about uh, Leshan and Wakama, since you're a, a committer on, on both projects, can you share some information on what's on, on the roadmap for both those projects? Mm, so for Leshan, uh, no, uh, we want to first stabilize the API uh, since uh, we are now uh, running Leshan in production at Sierra Wireless, we want to start to, 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 to stabilize the API and try to get a 1.0 uh, so people can start build on top of that and we are now we are we have the, the experience about how to use Leshan for building um, production systems so we know the API is, is okay now so we just want to fix the last problem and to, to try to, to, to create a proper 1.0 release. Um, what we are working on also is to integrate certificates. Uh, it's still uh, um, a branch. We want to put that on the, on the master. Um, yes, and um, yes, and the big news is the website. It was long for us to, to do a website, but now we have a, uh, a website. So on uh, eclipse.org slash Um And for Wakama, Wakama was, again, was uh, a bit like Lation. We, all the feature was coming months after months. Mm, now Wakama is supporting more and more feature of the Lightweight m 2 stack. Um, now uh, the new uh, feature we see now uh, for Wakama is more simple example on to run that on this target and um, and maybe some documentation and the website and make a proper release also. It's really about maturing the, the, the two projects. Okay. Uh, and regarding the lightweight M2M specification, do you have any, I, I think, at the moment, like what M2M is 1.0, right? And so what, uh, what's next are there like other um, objects that they're going to standardize or their techniques? Uh, I don't have a lot of information on that. Uh, I think it's really like, well, it's not so surprising, but it's like uh, Wakama and, and Lishan is, um, you've seen a lot of modification in the specification recently. It's already addressing issues uh, found during testing and the first uh, interrupt testing and the first uh, people building production environment with that. So yes, I think the uh, nothing big is going to be added for now. Uh, it's more about polishing the specification. It's okay. I'm not. Uh, I'm not participating at the elaboration of the of the of the standard. But from what I see from outside, it's uh, it's really that they're already just changing and trying to stabilize everything. Yeah, 
I think just like uh, co-op is prob probably going to get a, a variation over TCP. I think they're looking at uh, possibly doing like one M two M over over TCP. Right. Yes, but for the first. <laughs> Uh, first, we need to, to do that for co-op, and then, yes, they're probably going to, to use it. Anyway, a lot of people want to use Lightweight M2M on top of, of TCP. Uh, now it's working great for constrained networks, but when you are not using so constrained network, or maybe you are using enterprise network, where UDP is filtered, or you are behind a NAT, uh, it's quite annoying. So yes, a lot of people want to want this feature. So yes, it's probably uh, going to happen in the, in the specification, or people are probably going to push uh, to have that. Yeah. Uh, are there other questions for, for Julian? Uh, maybe uh, in the meantime, while you prepare and send your questions, I can uh, just uh, share some information on what's going to be next for us with virtual IoT. Uh, you may have received an email actually about, uh, a couple hours ago. The um, the next meetup is on um, is in two weeks and it's going to be with Azure Systems, and we are going to have a presentation of uh, what they do uh, for um, uh, for doing Java uh, on embedded systems, and of course that that means uh, IoT as well. So they have this uh, Zulu embedded uh, open source Java um, uh, VM. And um, yeah, uh, we will have a demo on how to, to use this on, for example, the Intel Edison or the Intel Galileo, and you will learn uh, everything on how to run your your Java projects on top of um, of Zulu. And I mean, why not uh, why not Lesson, right? So um, I don't I don't, I don't see other questions. So Julian, as you said, I think you're pretty uh, easy to contact, and uh, you will put the slides uh, on SlideShare. Yeah, and we put sorry. the link on the meetup. Yeah. So the link will be in the meetup, and if you have any questions um, in the in the days to come, feel free to to let us and, and, and Julian. So Julian, thank you for for uh, for doing this presentation. Sorry for the Google Hangouts issues. <laughs> we figured it out. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Take care.